rotations of complex projective spaces. <coughs> thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for this nice workshop. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Okay, so what I am going to tell you today is joint work with Victor Ginsburg. And so that's going to be a very disorganized talk probably. There are just, um, I should say, different flavors of proofs and results. So I couldn't make up my mind focusing on one single thing. So I probably there won't be much proof, but I'll try to give you a flavor of what's going on here. Um, so, okay. All right. So, um, pardon me. Okay, I will try. <laughs> okay, I will try. So let me start by giving you the definition and then maybe give you a bit of motivation and then um, some results would be the right way to do it probably. Okay, so the definition is this. So, so this is a, so let's take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN. And we say that this is a pseudo rotation um, let's write it this way hereby I will simply refer to it, uh, it as p r if it has exactly m plus one periodic orbits um, let's write it this way, okay? Well, in the case of CPN, we have um, Arnold's conjecture, so we know that this is, that there has to be at least m plus one fixed point, so this also means that these are all one periodic orbits, basically. So um, this is the minimum number. for CPN. Okay, so uh, of course, as I said in the case here, let's write one here, indicate the one periodic orbits or fixed points of this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So this is all periodic orbits CPN. Okay, so example, of course, uh, you take an irrational rotation of the two sphere. Um, okay. Um, uh, all right. So where does the so? Let me leave it at that with the definition and the first example and um, give you uh, a bit of the motivation where this old story comes from, uh, why we sort of decided to look into this uh, kind of question. So the motivation, first of all, well, uh, comes from low dimensional dynamics, low dimensional dynamics. In dimension two for the sphere, um, for this, for the disk D2, the closed disk, this kind of, um, this sort of maps have been extensively studied. There is a huge um, history to this, which I am not going to get to here. Uh, the whole thing starting from questions such as whether there are um, homeomorphisms of R n to begin with, or R2, uh, with dense orbits, for example. And then uh, the question is related to like properties like topological entropy, whether the map is mixing or not mixing, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, there's 
a really rich history of this when the, in the case of n is equal to 1, um, for CP1, for S2, or D2, situation is a bit different than more difficult for D2. In the case of D2, of course, you're looking at uh, a pseudo rotation is you have just one fixed point, the origin, uh, and nothing else, basically. This is an area and uh, orientation preserving diffeomorphism, for instance. And most recently, it was studied by Barney. Um, I will get to Barney's results a bit later, probably. Um, and so he studied this question for DISC, and um, he you know, gave a proof of uh, uh, examples, construct examples of an important thing here, um, important kind of pseudo rotations. He studied with DISCs, methods using um, finite energy foliations. Um, so this is, of course, in the simplistic context. Let's put it this way. Maybe using techniques. So the, the second kind of motivation al uh, also comes from um, colony conjecture type things. Okay, so recall that let's recall that colony conjecture asserts the existence of infinitely many periodic, simple periodic orbits of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism on a let's say closed uh, symplectic manifold. And uh, let me take this opportunity to update you on what is the sort of what we know at the moment. So we know the following thing. We know that uh, Colney conjecture holds. So maybe I should say, I should write what we know. Uh, if there is no um, sphere, <laughs> It's a strange way to write it, but this is what it is. Uh, A in pi 2 m, um, such that both omega and, uh, this is an and, this is important, um, C1 on A are positive, then Colney conjecture holds meaning that we have infinitely many simple periodic orbits, basically. So, um, so this form, of course, includes manifolds like negative man monotone manifolds, all symplectically spherical manifolds, whenever C1 is equal to zero, and some new examples like weakly exact symplectic manifolds, basically. So now, uh, what happens is that this is the sort of, I'm not going to get into the history of Colony conjecture here, but it's uh, obviously, you know, obviously false for some nice symplectic manifolds of interest, such as this example shows the, uh, you know, uh, rotation, irrational rotation on the sphere. So, not just CPN, but, um, Grass minions, uh, cogent orbits of compact E groups, etc., all admit Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms with finitely many simple periodic orbits. Uh, however, there is one common uh, feature of all these examples. They are all the ones we know are of this type. Basically, they always are uh, non degenerate. The number of periodic orbits is always the sum of Betti numbers, simple periodic orbits. Uh, always, uh, these are already fixed points. Um, odd dimensional homology is always zero on such manifolds. Etc. So they share the, this, a good number of um, uh, properties. So basically, we decided that maybe 
it's a good idea to try to understand a little bit what type of <laughs> maps these maps are. So with the motivation also coming from low dimensional dynamics, we thought, okay, so again, name, uh, pseudo rotation also here, what happens in the two dimensional cases that when you restrict the map to the boundary of the disk, you get an irrational rotation number. So, uh, so this is kind of the, where the name comes from. So this sort of map, maps, I didn't assume many non-degeneracy here, but actually all known examples are non-degenerate and some of the examples, some of the results, quite a bit of the results hold in the non-degenerate case actually. So it all fits into this um, type of situation. All right, so now uh, let me go back to, <laughs> you may now ask the question, what are the, examples we have other than S2. Um, well, uh, we have the so-called true rotations. So let me try to, yeah, that's in front of me. So generalizations of this irrational rotation to CPN. So these are given by um, quadratic Hamiltonians. So this is what we call true rotations or rotations. So here you have, let me write Q. Okay, so I'm thinking of CPN as the quotient here, which leaves in 2m plus 1. Um, the, okay, so cm plus 1. So let's write z here. So these are going to be lambda i zi square. Um, and then this will give us a rotation, R sub Q, let me denote it this way. Maybe I'm uh, going to denote it phi sub Q. How about that? To be consistent. Uh, one can actually assume that the sum of um, lambda i's are equal to zero. Uh, this is equivalent to assuming that uh, Q is normalized to have zero integral uh, over CPN. Um, okay, so we get a phi sub q, and this becomes uh, non-degenerate um, if and only if, with this um, normalization I'm using, the difference between lambda i's and lambda j's are not integers, which makes sense, right? The eigenvalues here are going to be the e to the 2 pi i, the differences, basically. Um, and strongly non-degenerate, here strongly non-degenerate means that all iterations of phi non-degenerate, so if this is phi, um, these are not rational. Okay? So this is the case we get uh, pseudo-rotations. Sub Q is a pseudo rotation. So, in general, periodic orbits of this include uh, the coordinate axis that we are going to get. It may have other things, but in this case, it's going to have only those m plus 1 corresponding to coordinate axis, basically. Okay, so now uh, other examples. Uh, for S2, uh, the, the, the good question here is, of course, are there any other examples which are not rotations? For S2, the answer to the question is yes. We have the um, Anas of Katok examples. Okay. So these are constructed using conjugation method, Miltonian perturbations of irrational rotations, like this one, uh, such that there are... Uh, exactly three ergodic invariant measures, the fixed points and the Lebesgue measure, and they are not conjugate to irrational rotation. Um, so, pseudo-rotations, um, which are not true rotations, so they exist. Okay? And 
Here is the weakest part of the whole story, if you wish. Uh, there are no other examples in higher dimensions. So, no examples other than things which are really rotations, basically. No, um, um, so let's say for CPN with n greater or equal to 2. However, um, this, uh, I mean, constructing such examples is actually one of the, so the one difficult question. Um, as far as I understand, I mean, as of yesterday, I was talking to Marta, actually, who looked into this question at some point, seriously. Um, it should be possible, I mean, my, my understanding is that both people in dynamical systems who are familiar with the methods of Anasov Katok um, and the symplectic side believe that this should be possible. There is no reason not to have them for CP2. So they should, it's believed that they should, at least for CP2, one should be able to construct these examples. However, it is difficult. This is my understanding. And in higher um, dimensions, all the more difficult, and apparently you get into like questions related to embeddings moving balls around and CP2, etc. So this is, yeah, you need to construct them, basically so. Um, so this is the situation with examples. Okay, so nonetheless, as I said, um, the, the, the good thing is that, however, uh, sort of restrictive class this may seem, one can actually say some interesting things about these maps, and this is like the, um, pretty much the topics of my talk today. All right, before I can say anything more, I need to give you a little bit of the background where the, uh, how these results are going to fit in. So there will be a little bit of, um, let's say, reminding us past results and some preliminaries. All right, so there will be uh, main players here and uh, two main players, maybe three main players as usual. Uh, will be the action, symplectic action, uh, colonist ender index, and the mean index. Um, so in order to be, so from now on, let's suppose that phi is a pseudo rotation. And I'm also going to, let's just assume everything is non-degenerate. Again, as I said, most results hold in this case. In fact, let's even assume strongly non-degenerate for now at least. So we can talk about only Zender index and all that. Um, so we have the fixed points equal to one periodic orbits, and the number is m plus one, and they are actually, so maybe, maybe I don't want to use number here. Let's do this. So let's give them the name x1, 0, x0 through xn. Um, as I said, there will be the action um, of a fixed point. In order to define the action or the index, so this will be the mean index notation, and there will be the condescender index. This I will denote without the hat. Um, uh, one needs to, you know, fix a capping of the orbit as usual. So if this is your x, and then you need to fix a capping disk, and then this will give you a trivialization along the orbit, um, uh, and we will have a linearized flow, which we are going to regard the standard story as a path of symplectic matrices, and then you're going to have all these notions defined, basically. Um, all right, so action spectrum um, is the action on all these orbits. And 
what else? For, for instance, for these, it's going to be um, union of lambda i plus z. Z will come from, you know, to, for the recapping effect. Um, now, some past results, what we know about them, facts. Uh, but um, Okay, the first one is that on the action spectrum, so let me write it this way, so this will be the x denotes any one of these things, bar denotes the capping, um, this is a subset of R, so um, let me get a, a different page myself. So there, there are two orderings um, on the action spectrum. So here's what I want to say. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between capped orbits and homology classes in this case because CPN is a very nice symplectic manifold. We know all the... Can you repeat the definition of the action, please? Um, you need to... integrate the symplectic manifold over a disk such that its boundary is x. Um, I maybe, I don't remember where I put the pluses and minuses, and then you integrate h, um, h dt, yeah, over the Okay, um, so what was I saying? So, um, So there is an, so I'll, I'll write it maybe. Capped orbits, capped periodic orbits are in a one-to-one -one correspondence between homology classes. Okay. And these guys are ordered by both action and index. You can think about it mean index or the Kolmazender index, which may be slightly easier. And the important thing is, and this is important, that this ordering coincides. Okay. Um, so in other words, here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, if, so Kolnizender index of say X bar is less than Kolnizender index of Y bar, if and only if uh, the actions obey the same rule. Okay. So this is one thing. Um, so, <laughs> all right, the second thing maybe I want, I mean, the way this thing works is really, really nice. You have the, the quantum homology for uh, CP, CPN, and then uh, if you take your generator, if you're working with homology classes and intersections, you can take Poincare due to the uh, C1, the hyperplane section. And then you basically um, order them like that. So, you know, if u is cpn minus 1, let's say, and then here you have u star u, which is your u squared. Um, and then here you have u0, which is the fundamental class. It goes like that. Here, uh, corresponding to this, you have index 2n index 2n minus 2, here you have uh, 2n minus 4, etc. It goes like that. Here you end up with u to the n being a point. Here you have 0 corresponding to that. From then on, you start u to the n plus 1. You have your relations on quantum homology. So this will be qcpn, where q is our recapping uh, 
you know, f formal variable in the Novikov ring, which is degree, in my case, minus 2 and plus 1, the minimal churn, goes like that, basically. And then if you go up, here you will have Q inverse, um, U to the N, et cetera. Right, so you have this kind of nice structure here. Now, what else do we have? Um, second thing I want to say is the following thing. Now that we have this in um, here at our disposal, I want to introduce the notion of augmented action, which Victor and I introduced to in, in one of our colony conjecture papers. The beauty of this is that this is uh, cooked up so that this is independent of capping. So this will be appropriately uh, the action on a capped orbit minus um, I am going to, I mean, you know, I haven't, there may be some discrepancies with these <laughs> indices. So here think of omega as lambda C1. Okay. So the recapping effect gets canceled out when you do this difference. So okay, very nice. So the nice thing about this is the following thing. Um, this is a theorem that goes back to, I don't remember, maybe 2010 or something. Uh, uh, and the theorem is this. So in the case of CPN, uh, all of these guys are equal. for a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN uh, of this type. Uh, okay. uh, for example, if your Hamiltonian is normalized and if it is a rotation, this number ends up being zero because you can calculate. Uh, otherwise, it's not known what this number is. At least it wasn't known explicitly. explicitly. It still isn't known, but in a much more recent paper, which goes back to the fall of 2016, we have actually identified what this is, and this turned out to be the asymptotic spectral invariant. So let me, it's not going to be terribly relevant, but I'm going to write it. So this is more like GG <laughs> fall 16. Um, so this is going to be the one associated with the fundamental class. So I'll write here h to the k. This is the Hamiltonian sum. And then you take the limit as k goes to infinity. So this is like this normalized thing. So it turns out that this is actually that number. Um, in order to prove this, you actually do use um, definitely this important to have this quantum homology structure, this ordering. And then you also need a lustanich schnellmann type result to order actually these actions and stuff. And then the proof works uh, along the lines of you, you count your orbits, basically, in two different ways. And the orderings coincide, and you get this result. So it is because of that, uh, whenever I have a pseudo rotation of CPN, does it work? I can actually treat um, up to a constant, which I am going to just ignore. I can treat action and index pretty much the same way. So basically, OK. So roughly speaking, up to a constant. So you can think of actions. I will write it this way because they are not exactly equal, but or the mean index. Um, okay, and because of this, I can also replace this by Colney-Zender index. So I can also think of them as 
Again, this is, I don't mean they are the same or <laughs> anything, so just not to be wrong, but you have this ordering, exactly the same kind of relation between, you can replace these by mean index, so that's what I mean uh, in this case. All right, yeah. Yes, this is all for this type of thing. Yeah. Right, so the, the spectral number C of H to the K yeah. will always be the action of the K iterate of the same order, I guess. Or not? No, it will not be. No. No. I'm not sure I understand the K iterate of this. One of the K or of the N plus one orbits, right? It, it <laughs> Uh, this is, I mean, this, this, yes, this is going to be, yes, sure. So, so that, I mean, k theta to an orbit is just k times, so the action of the k, k theta, it's just the k times the action of the orbit, right? Uh, yes, it so is. This, is our, this uh, action a tilde, or also like the action of one of the orbits? In this case, yes, it will be, okay. definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it will be. Yes, yes, you're, you're right, yes, definitely in this case it, it certainly will be. Uh, and then in fact it is used to, uh, yeah, prove that <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what goes into the proof of showing that, yeah. So, I mean, one needs to be, yeah, you're right, essentially, yes. Okay, so then, uh, another thing is, in another direction, is the, sp we have some resonance relation type results. Um, so this is, goes to ginsburg kerman so here is again a paper in 2010 or roughly around that area. Um, so they proved that the mean indices satisfy a resonance relation, so a resonance relation is something like that. AIs are integers, non-trivial, not all zero. So the relation is this, mod, however, uh, minimal churn number. So, you know, mean this is always defined, well-defined, modulo twice the minimal, uh, uh, minimal churn. So, so this is kind of one of the past results, and they conjectured that, in fact, so let's write GK in some form, that this should be the case. It's the case for S2, for example. You get, you know, alpha minus alpha, and then you add them, and they cancel, etc. Okay, so now we know that this is the case for, for instance, uh, pseudo rotations of CP2. That's one of our results. Um, but in general, this is not known somehow. It's an open question, and already for CP2, it uses pretty non-trivial <laughs> things to, to see that resonance relation. Okay, so now, um, um, let me just see if I have to say anything else before I tell you some results, basically, how I want to tell you. Okay, so... Well, I cannot, in the, I mean, in, the, in this form, in the, the, as I will write the result, this result holds for a certain type of pseudo rotations, which we call balance, and that does require non-degeneracy, sort of. Um, um, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are other resonance relations, etc. I, I mean, this very specific one for CP2, it's, yeah. But the difficulty is that you cannot perturb the superarization and keep the Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so now. 
results. So I want to tell you the interesting things. Uh, okay. I don't know where to start. Let's start with uh, rigidity, let's say. Just to. Okay. So this is, uh, again, in dimension two, this is um, Barney's theorem. And uh, Barney proves that uh, if you assume that the pseudo rotation has a so called exponential, exponentially Lewy rotation number, uh, then pseudo rotations are C0 rigid, means that for a sequence converging to infinity, they converge to C0 converged identity, basically. Okay? So I will write the result in for CPN, so the n equals to two case will be Barney's result, basically. Uh, it, he actually worked with the disk closed, disk, so which, which is, he did, I mean, he's, it's, a, it's more difficult for the disk, of course. So we only do for CPN. So, um, for S2, I'm going to write that for. Um, so here's a theorem. So theorem is this. Um, again, CPN, pseudo rotation um, with fixed points x0 through xn. Um, so let's form the, you know, a vector of with, with the mean indices here. So this will be um, x0, so I'll write it this way. Now this is going to be uh, some vector in the torus. So this will be r m plus 1 mod um, 2m plus 1, z to the m plus 1, I suppose. Um, and so the assumption is that I'm going to assume that um, I'll write what that means is exponentially you will, just like Barney's case. And this means that for every exponent c, uh, there exists a ki sequence going to infinity such that um, maybe ki here is not the right uh, notation, let's say ji sequence, such that when I look at So this is the distance closest to an integer vector here on the torus. Uh, this is less than exponential minus c j i. Okay. Distance to the identity in the group, so let's say distance to the origin. So this is what it means to be exponentially Lewy. Uh, I didn't write the result, but as in the case, of, in, in Barney's case, this, um, this type of thing, they have zero measure, but uh, they are of second bear category, this type of rotation numbers. Okay, so the result is that there exists a ki going to infinity such that uh, phi to the ki approaches, c0 approaches identity. From this, Barney, for instance, derives that such a phi is not mixing. This is, was one of the things. Um, okay. So the method to prove this is, again, um, really you, you use the structure of CPN. So you have this correspondence between capped orbits and homology classes. You look at the Floer connecting trajectory that connects, let's say, Y bar to Z bar, and then you look at its energy. Energy then will be given by the action difference, or in this case, the mean index difference. And the fact that these mean indices are exponentially Lewis, so they converge to zero, uh, sort of it allows you to argue just like uh, in the case of 
Barney. So to conclude that, uh, after you do some analysis, to conclude that this is zero convergence to identity, basically. So I, let me not get into it at the moment. So just to tell you a few more of other flavors of other results. Uh, okay, so this is rigidity. There is a nice result. which concerns uh, invariant sets. Uh, and uh, here we have a, a very difficult theorem, actually a very difficult theorem of Lecavez and Yoko's. Uh, I'm going to only tell you the, the case that sort of is uh, relevant for us. The theorem is much more general. So this goes to 97, okay? So if you have a pseudo rotation of S2, um, it's, they basically say a, a consequence. They say that it is far from being minimal. It's got lots of dense, uh, sorry, non-dense orbits, basically. A PR. Okay, um, and what we have is um, their results actually holds for homeomorphisms, but ours is only concerns pseudo rotation simultaneous diffeomorphisms. We say the following thing: if you have a pseudo rotation of CPN. Uh, then for every periodic orbit or fixed point, it's the same thing, uh, this fixed point is not isolated as an invariant set. Okay. So in other words, every neighborhood uh, contains a full orbit, basically. And this uses, this is a very easy consequence of yet another theorem, actually. Uh, so this proof uh, actually follows from uh, another theorem that goes back to 14 or something. Uh, I mean, it uses substantially. And this theorem tells us the following thing. If you have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN, it doesn't have, this has nothing to do with pseudo rotations. And if it has a fixed point, a periodic point, fixed point, periodic point, whichever, uh, which is isolated as an invariant set, isolated invariant, let me write it like this, and that it is homologically essential, so local floor homology is not zero, uh, then uh, you have infinite many periodic orbits, infinite many simple periodic orbits. We stated for hyperbolic orbits, but the proof works in this case, basically. Um, and then if you look at now in this case, what you see is that, uh, well, in the case of a pseudo rotation, of course, all of these periodic orbits or fixed points are going to be essential. Um, and uh, uh, if it were isolated, we would have to have infinitely many, but we don't. It's a pseudo rotation, so basically. Uh, this is a non-trivial result, of course. I mean, that uses like uh, a version of Gromov compactness theorem as well as the, the action of quantum homology on filtered Fuller homology. It's got two different flavors of components, uh, components to its proof. Um, um, again, this is a different kind of story here. Um, uh, it also works for some other manifolds, but not uh, 
um, you know, as I said, it uses the, the quantum homology structure of CPN and it can work whenever this kind of structure is present. So some grass minions, for instance. All right, so next results I want to tell you about um, is the following. I mean, this is a very nice result, of course, because again, this is a very difficult theorem uh, in, the, in dimension two. Um, is what concerns is a recurrence theorem. Lagrangian recurrence, Lagrangian Poincare recurrence. Okay. So this is a version of symplectic Poincare recurrence uh, question or conjecture. The first time I heard it from Victor, um, but there may be other, other people I don't know. So here is the conjecture. So let's call it RPR. So let's take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of a closed symplectic manifold. Um, let's take a closed Lagrangian. And claim is that there exists a sequence of iterations such that all these guys, again, I'm going to attribute it to Ginsburg. V turbo 2, th that's true. Let's put it this way. Such that phi to the ki L intersects L non-empty. Very non-trivial <laughs> uh, conjecture, obviously. So, so we, we don't know, we didn't know till now any results whatsoever. I mean, if you think about it, it's already, I mean, if you give me a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, your Lagrangian, if, if, if he is fixed, your Lagrangian could be very small, very weird, whatever. There is no reason maybe for an OK it's going to intersect. Uh, right, so, um, so here is a theorem which we can say something about this uh, for two rotations. Okay, so I'm going to write it this way. LPR holds for phi a pseudo rotation L is a Lagrangian, close Lagrangian, which admits a metric without contractible closed geodesics, which is one of I mean, standard assumptions in this type of thing. Um, like a torus. Um, close geodesics. Then, well, I already stated the results. So in this case, uh, actually we can prove that this type of, this recurrence theorem, this conjecture holds. Um, as, as I said, it's a very small class of uh, diffeomorphism, but uh, it's the first of its kind. So in that sense, it's nice. I like it, at least. Um, yeah, OK. I don't know. I mean, to prove this, what we do is we first relate, we first prove the following theorem. Maybe I can tell you the intermediate theorem what goes into it, uh, just so that you have an idea. Um, OK, so one component of the proof, it uses uh, the following theorem. And this is, again, we have a pseudo rotation. Uh, so, so everything is a pseudo rotation here. Uh, there exists a 
sequence of iterations such that when you look at the gamma norm, so there is this notion of gamma norm in simplistic topology. So again, this is the Hamiltonian sum of ki copies of h, that this goes to zero. Uh, gamma norm uh, for any Hamiltonian, let's make it f, is just the spectral invariant corresponding to h. And then you add the spectral invariant corresponding to h inverse, which is the one generates the inverse flow. Um, but uh, in this case, it's actually, this is actually an uh, action gap. So you can, instead of that, you can put a minus sign, you can put point here, and keep h rather than writing h inverse. So I'll write it. <laughs> Thank you. h is f. OK. And now once you prove this theorem, uh, you need to remember the relation between gamma norm and other things like homological capacity. Uh, the, you know, the energy that requires to displace a certain subset. Um, and then through this relation, uh, we can obtain the result. In, a, in other words, um, I'll write it. Let's write it this way. And I'm going to write it the homological capacity of L. Um, this will be the, again, these are, I mean, this is standard notion. So you look at open sets con containing L. So it relates to this. And this, of course, as I said, by definition, uh, it relates to the displaceability property. And there is a relation between uh, gamma norm and, uh, and the norm that's defined through homological capacity, which we call capacity norm. And then, because of this, you, you get the result, basically. Um, OK, so a few more things. Maybe I'm not even going to write Maybe I'm going to write because we had this, <laughs> we had this thing. So another component of this whole story is index-related results, resonance relations, etc. Some of which I have already uh, came about. Um, so one of the key things that happened, and in this part maybe I won't even write anything. It turns out that to a to the rotation, you can actually associate a true rotation. Um, uh, whenever it is so which we call this a matching rotation and it turns out that basically um, all the numerical invariants of rotations um, rotations are in that sense not distinguishable from pseudo rotations so they have again under some assumptions they, they have same Floca multipliers, uh, same uh, index spectrum, uh, same uh, therefore action spectrum, uh, labeled spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. So th there is this type of results, uh, all of which uses another theorem which we prove, like some index results, basically. Um, and, um, and let me write that CP2 results, too. So for this, let me just write one line definition. So what I want to do is add one more component to this pseudo rotation business. And let's suppose that I want to uh, consider the non-degenerate case. And I am going to index the orbits, fixed points, sorry cap them rather than index them. So that I'm in the following situation. Kolnizender index of xi bar is 2i minus n. So these indices range from minus n uh, through n. So they are all within this range. So a definition. Uh, in this case, with this kept this way, 
uh, phi is called, we call it balanced, if the sum of mean indices is equal to zero. Example, strong and non-degenerate rotations, irrational rotations. Okay. Okay, pseudo rotations, of course. I mean, true rotations, um, which are pseudo rotations in our definition. And here is a result. We can prove that, as I said, a conjecture is that this is true for all pseudo rotations, but we can prove it for CP2 for strong and non degenerate ones. The rotation of CP2 is balanced. And not only that, we can also prove that uh, all of the fixed points are elliptic. And in fact, we first proved that fixed points are elliptic, and then we use it in the proof of this balanced business. Okay? Before you ask me, I, let me say that this proof, the fact that fixed points are elliptic, definitely doesn't go through already for CP3. And that proof uh, also uses uh, this theorem that I erased, that if you have a hyperbolic orbit, then you have infinitely many periodic orbits. So it, it is also somewhat uses some very non-trivial components to, it, uh, to show that these fixed points must be elliptic, actually. And then, to show that this is balanced, as I said, I will use an index theorem that I haven't written down here because it's kind of lengthy, as well as the fact that all fixed points are elliptic. So this is a, I mean, we are still sort of writing this paper. There are lots of nice components. So comments, questions, otherwise I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Mark? Can you explain briefly maybe 